Hello everyone and I'm really delighted to be speaking with Curly Sue, also known as uh, Suzanne Curlew. Curly Sue, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Oh, well, I'm very excited too because we, uh, you were on a panel that I was hosting recently at the VegFest UK and I was just so impressed by your experiences and, and what you've been doing, what you've achieved. So um, I'm really delighted to kind of dig a little bit further thank and you. just focus on you um, today. So first of all, I'm just going to read uh, Curly Sue's bio out to introduce her. So Curly Sue, as I mentioned, also known as Suzanne Curlew, is an award-winning published author, vegan social media influencer, and TV presenter based in London in the UK. She stars in her own a vegan cooking show, Curly Sue's Global Kitchen on Amazon Prime, which is currently available both in the UK and the US. The three-part series was filmed in the UK and on location in Montego Bay, Jamaica. Curly Sue has a new plant-based cookbook out called Cooking with Kids, and she's a popular keynote speaker and regular media commentator. Her professional background is in internal communications and PR, with more than 15 years experience working with corporate companies, public sector organisations and PR agencies, including Network Rail and BBC Radio London. Wow, that's a very impressive resume. <laughs> You've really done your homework. <laughs> I have. I've been checking on the LinkedIn profile on the website, checking out. I think yeah. it's great because what I love is that you've come from this corporate background and then you've, you've really, you've crafted this um this business this uh, you know way of being doing what you love you know writing cooking speaking uh you know having your own tv show on amazon prime which is wonderful so i was wondering if you could just talk to us a little bit about your journey to becoming curly sue um you know i, think, I believe you're based in london so like did you grow up there or you know tell us yes. a little bit about your your background from when you were young just in a nutshell um to where you are now yeah I was born and I was raised in London and in terms of getting to the Curly Sue's kitchen and all I do with that, I became a vegetarian when I was 18 and then when I was, and then after about 20 years or so of being a vegetarian, I decided to become a vegan. But prior to becoming a vegan, when I first started to become a vegetarian, there was lots of recipes that I didn't like. They didn't really suit my style of cooking or I didn't find them as interesting or to my taste. So I used to keep a folder with recipes that I did like, or if I found a recipe I liked and I tweaked it, I'd record that in some way, um, either on my computer or in a book. So then after a while I thought, Actually, there's a lot of recipes here I could possibly write my own cookbook so I decided to write my own cookbook and I had been in touch with a TV channel in America prior to writing the cookbook and when I'd written the cookbook I remember they'd asked me to come and host a cooking show but I hadn't been doing anything with regards to cooking at the time so once I'd written the cookbook I thought oh let me contact them, which I did, and they said, oh, brilliant, get on a plane. Now, prior to going to them, they're called 3ABN Television, and they're in West Frankfurt, Illinois. Um, prior to going on to their channel, what I realized is I need to make sure my social media presence is in order. So then I thought, okay, set up an Instagram set up a Facebook, Twitter, all of these things. I didn't do them all at once, but I thought, let me at least get a Facebook and um, my YouTube. I had the YouTube channel before, so I put all those things in place. So then having done the shows in America, I was there and I recorded some shows. They invited me back and I went back and forth to America for about four years recording shows every time I went. I'd go in and film a batch of shows and then come back. Did you pay your own way or like did they, like did no, you fund no. that? So they, they flew you over? Well, it's a bit more complex than that. So I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, which is a Christian religion. And Seventh-day Adventist churches are a bit different in the structure to other Christian churches where we're networked. So we have a conference for the South of England. In the UK, there's the South of England conference, the North England conference, 
England, Ireland, Scotland and Welsh missions. Um, the difference between a, a mission and a conference is just the, the size that governs the number of people in that jurisdiction. So the South England conference paid for me to fly to um, America to film the shows. And 3ABN says, the minute you hit America, we will take care of all the costs. So they pay for all the ingredients, the transportation and all of that stuff. Nice. As well. so that was nice. Really good. Oh, and okay. um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church also paid for me to stay in a hotel because the journey to get there is quite a punishing one because you have to fly from London to Chicago or Texas, which is about eight, nine hours. Then from there, you have to fly on a domestic flight because there's no direct flight to mm. St. Louis International Airport. Yeah. And then from St. Louis, it's a two and a half hour drive to get out to where they are because they're yeah. on 82 acres of land in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> right fun. wow okay so you did the cooking show in america um mm -hmm. which is great and then you've come back and then you've just you've been on social media and and just like raised your profile from from there amazing yeah. wonderful but tell me i want to go back a little bit further though to your to your growing up in london as a child and i'll, I'll tell you why because i'm curious because you know obviously you're you're a woman of colour. And the reason I'm asking this is like, I grew up in, I was born in London. I'm technically a Cockney. I was born in the East End of London, but I grew up in Dartford and I was adopted. Now I, my birth family, my birth father uh, is Persian. And I didn't know that I only traced him back in 2012. Oh, okay. But anyway, I grew up in an in a, in a environment with my white parents in Kent, in Dartford, which is just outside Southeast London. And my mum was really racist, including towards me. So she would say all kinds of bad things, but you should go back to where you came from, like really kind of quite nasty stuff. So I kind yeah. of grew up with this thing of, you know, and I'm, you know, obviously I'm white, I'm, you know, I didn't identify with that heritage because I, you know, I was adopted and I grew up in Dartford, but like I knew there was something bad or something wrong. And then of course I saw the revolution when I was 13 on the TV and I thought, Oh my God, I don't want anyone to know. I'm, I, I have even, you know, any kind of, you know, Persian blood in me or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But also I remember being at school and I'm probably a fair bit older than you. I remember being at school and one of the teachers had a daughter and she was biracial and they didn't call it that back then. They used another word, not very nice, but yeah. you know what I mean? But, um, yeah. but, and no one was really horrible to her from what I saw, but they did say, I noticed like you'd see people nudging like they say, oh, she's, you know what I mean? Uh, like it was just that, and it was, I could tell even at that age, I, you know what I mean? I sort of experienced that kind of racism like within the home and, and to tell me that there's something not quite right, you know, unless you're not white, you know what I mean? So I'm just curious maybe things were different when you grew up. And also we were singing terrible songs at school that were in, you know, you look back now and cringe, like how could they be teaching kids to sing these, these songs, you know? Um, so I'm curious, did you experience any of that or had it kind of changed a bit by the time you were growing up? Well, um, just to kind of disclose, I'm actually 51, so I'm guessing we're Oh, not are you? Oh, okay. <laughs> so we're similar. Well, I'm 54, so okay. okay well, there you go. Yeah, I thought I you thought... were younger. Oh, it's the vegan yeah. diet. There we go. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what was your um, experience? Growing up, I grew up, I was born in London and I went to school in London. And the experiences you have are in the first instance is your hair because my hair is obviously different to somebody who's white and there was always comments about oh your hair can't do that your hair isn't this your hair isn't that and also when you go to school the school dinners are very different to what you would eat at home I mean at home my, my, my parents are Jamaican so they cook Jamaican food but when I was small they, they only could cook a limited amount because Today in a supermarket, you can get whatever you want from wherever in the world almost. But back then it was certainly not the case. So growing up, it was difficult because you were seen as different and people would call you racist names. My younger sister and I were victims of bullying. Like we were coming home and people were, there were these two girls who would pick on us us and try to beat us up when we were going home and they would call us really horrible names which I won't repeat yeah very racist names and I just thought this is a lot of hate where do they find the energy for all of this have they got nothing better to do so because we had problems in that school my mum pulled us out 
and we were tutored at home for a while. But prior to that, if I go back a bit further, I was born in London, but when I was, I think, five, my parents took me and my sisters, because I have three sisters, one older and two younger, they took us to Jamaica because they didn't want us to grow up not knowing much about our culture. They didn't want us to be the dumb cousins who go, oh, I don't know what that is. Oh, what's that chicken? Oh, that. And my mum's like, no, we're not having that. You must know the national anthem. You must know the national heroes. You must know about your heritage. So we lived in Jamaica for about four or five years. So I came back to England when I was 10. So when I came back to England, I didn't have a British accent, obviously, because I'd been living in Jamaica for four or five years. And they picked on me because of that. They picked on me for a lot of things. And then we, we moved schools um, a number of times. But then my mum got fed up moving us from different schools. And then I eventually convinced my parents to send me to a stage school. So I went to the Sylvia Young Theatre School and I did oh. not have those problems there at all. Oh, nice. Because... In the theatrical world, you have to be able to get on with people regardless of who they are, where they come from, the background, because you're there to work and you have to be professional. But even socially in the stage school, I didn't have any of those problems at all. Not, yeah. not at all. So that was kind of like relief. Yeah. But in terms of growing up, I did have some teachers. Before I went to the stage school, I did have some teachers who said things like, oh, you're black and you're a woman, so you can't be a doctor, you can't be a lawyer and things like that. Wow. But my parents would say, don't listen to them. They're just saying that because they're ignorant. You can be whatever you want to be, but I'm going to be honest with you, because you're black and you're a woman, you have to work 10 times harder than everyone else because the minute they see you, they already come to conclusions as to why they're not going to give you the job. So you have to push so that you're better than everyone else who's interviewing for a particular role. Wow. So that's what I learned. But going to a stage school, they teach you not because of racism, because if you're in show business, they say, right, you're in a room, there's 10 of you. Why should they pick you for the job? What have you done differently to make everybody else in the room look like they haven't even made an effort? What have you done? And that helped strengthen me and know how to push Wow, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And just following on from that, I know you touched on this when we did the panel at VegFest UK. Uh, well, actually, yes, I think you wrote an article, or you were quoted in an article re quite recently where you were saying, even on the vegan scene and externally, you, as a woman of colour, you still find it, uh, you know, you've still got to push and keep pushing to even, you know, kind of get those platforms uh, and what have you. Can you just speak a little bit about that, that that's still kind of happening even up until now? Yes, what um, people say to me, oh, you managed to, you know, get lots of bookings and do lots of speaking engagements and so forth. And I wish the case was that I had lots of different vegan festivals contacting me to say, oh, can you come and speak for us? I had to contact them. Um, they, were, they weren't resistant or anything. They were like, oh, yes, yes. And some of them said, oh, yeah, we've heard of you, which was kind of even more annoying. Um, but they hadn't reached out to me and said, we'd like to book you for um, to speak at our vegan festival or to do a cooking demo or anything. So what I realized is within the vegan community, there's still, there's so, still some events you go to and everybody there is white. Now, there's nothing wrong with white folks, <laughs> it's funny, but there isn't just white people in the world. And if you think of the nine strands of diversity, why isn't there a good cross-section of representation of people from those protected categories reflected in the panel? So my, I've been able to speak at lots of different events only because I've contacted them and said, hello, um, this is me, this is my information about me, I'll be interested in working with you and so forth. And then they'll say, oh, okay. But prior to that, I'd look on the panel and think, well, what's going on? And there's, and I'm, I don't know if he lives in America. I think he's here. There's an American male. can't remember his name. He's black and he has dreadlocks and he speaks at some... Is that um, Christopher? Event. Christopher Sebastian? I think so. And he said that. He said, why is it always white folks here? He yeah. said, they're not the only people in the world. So I didn't really challenge 
interested and in that respect I just put myself forward and said I'm interested and they said yes but I've never really kind of called them out but I did do a interview with Vegan Ventures the vegan radio station in the UK and what he said when I was interviewed on one of, by one of their presenters is oh well the thing is it's not that people are not being inclusive it's just they just don't know who to find and probably just don't know and I said okay let's work with that in England I would say that English people are some of the world-class researchers in the globe they've done research on things that I look at it and think I didn't even know you could do research on that and they've found out things that I thought how did you find that out some of the best research in the world so I said when you want to research it you can so I don't accept that yeah you can you just chosen not to or you yeah. just have not occurred to you for some reason I said if it's about research I can't see what the problem is so yeah that that's been my experience with the vegan community I haven't had much negativity but when the whole black lives matter thing black lives matter happened um oh, a few weeks ago I was shocked at some of the comments that were being made the negative the comments very right not all but there yeah. were some and i thought wow. oh yeah i know i see what you mean yeah online i get yeah right right some of the comments online i thought okay and and why i find it more annoying from vegans is it's all about the lives of animals so a, a living breathing human being not human being a living breathing creature is being eaten killed and eaten and you're taking a stand for an animal but when it's black people you're not interested mm -hmm. okay that's interesting because i thought that what we're saying is help we're being killed and you as a vegan say oh well why why are they complaining um other lives matter too yes they matter too but they're not being killed by the police they're not not by the on this scale yeah so that's what annoyed me more about the vegan community is i think you do know better you're just choosing to not apply the same principles mm. to other human beings yeah Some, and it's interesting but, um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. yeah no no go ahead it's right um it's interesting the whole black lives matter because you know obviously what what we've seen sort of happen is obviously that it's like the, the really negative side of it and then we've seen this other side where certainly a lot of media outlets and individuals and, and organizations and companies have literally kind of just scrambled and gone oh my gosh and i think some of it is probably from good intent genuine good intentions like oh okay and other times it's almost like they're trying to look i think woke is the word or the millennial word or pc though politically correct and i noticed there was a headline actually about you and it was about your tv show your amazon prime show and i think the headline was black chef gets amazon prime show now i'm curious what do you think about that do you think it's it's a good thing that that's up because then it's kind of breaking those stereotypes that oh yeah black chefs you know chefs are not all white vegan chefs are not all white or do you find it kind of really frustrating like because you wouldn't have white chef gets the show what are your thoughts on that i'm kind of in two frames of mind so it was um, Veg News who picked up the story about me getting my series on Amazon Prime. And to be honest, Veg News is probably the biggest vegan news outlet in the world. So I was, to be honest, I was so glad to have it because I knew the publicity would drive um, viewers to my program that I was just happy to have it. There were a lot of people who did comment under the article and said, why have you mentioned what color she is for a start we can see that she's black <laughs> picture is quite obvious and why why are you saying that i do see what they mean because for me i think well i think from a media point of view they're kind of highlighting positive things about black people trying to and in them um giving the article that title it's kind of showing that Veg News is on board and is doing things to work with the black yeah. community. So in that respect, I understand. And for what was going on at the time, I understand. But if you think of it in isolation, it's kind of, if I was white, they wouldn't say white chef gets her own show. But then white people don't have problems getting shows. So yeah. I kind of understand both arguments. And to be honest, I'm just really glad because 
when Veg News picked it up, other media, vegan media outlets get their info straight from them. So it had a knock on effect and it was re it really worked for me yeah so. oh that's good no and i mean i think and to give veg news the due i mean i i did see like because i watched the, the v i think out of all the vegan media outlets i think they really have been consistently not just now that you know it's kind of you know like the, the protests aren't as big now whatever they're still continuing to do that so i i do feel like they've genuinely yeah kind mm -hmm. of taken that on which is a, a good thing whereas i think maybe some others not necessarily vegan outlets but i think other like companies and what have you have, have sort of jumped on a band like like oh look at us we're we you know we're we're pc but yeah it was just curious i mean i've had that in the past like sometimes i think someone i think i was quoted an article in sub tabloid and they and it was nothing to do with sexuality or anything but somehow they put in i think lesbian journalist katrina Fart, and i was like it's why have you put that it's like i don't care you know what i mean i'm not in the closet or anything god knows but i just thought how bizarre that you would mention that when it's nothing to do with the story so i mean and that i think was probably much more sensationalism rather than anything else but yeah i was yeah. just curious about that now i know just on the subject as well you talked about in, at the vegfest uk panel an experience you had when you uh, had a new job and you turned up and you sat in the quote wrong uh, at the wrong desk. Do you remember? Could you tell us a little bit about that? And because I love how you responded to this uh, as well. So tell us what happened. So I was doing a corporate contract and I started on the first day as the um, head of internal communications for a particular company. So I came in and the receptionist had told me which desk I was and it had my name there. So I went to sit in the desk and the person sitting next to me, who was one of the PAs, said, oh, I'm really sorry, you can't sit there. I thought, oh. So I looked, I could see my name and I said, okay. And she said, sorry, no, the PA sits at the back. So this was interesting because none of the PAs are black. So... Not that that would make it okay, but I could more understand to a point. So I ignored her and I just sat down and she was like, no, 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 excuse me. You can't sit there because Suzanne Curley's coming. She's my new boss and she's going to be sitting there. So you can't sit there. And then she was kind of coming up behind me as if to say, oh, come on, get up, get up, get up. And I thought, oh, this is not the first time something like this has happened to me. And I said, um just to let you know i am suzanne curly and she went oh i'm fine oh oh oh, so, oh, oh re i'm really sorry the main thing for me is why did you think i wasn't suzanne curly now i know suzanne curly doesn't sound it's not obvious where i'm from it's not like you to sing you know that person's going to be asian you know or you know or another name where it's really obvious what the person's going to look like so I understand that to a point, but telling me that, oh, you need to sit at the back because that's where the PA sits and assuming I was the PA was not nice at all because one of the reasons I went to university, got a degree, got experience is because I don't want to be seen in that level of job. But it doesn't make any difference. It, it still happens. So she was really, because she turned out to be, she was my PA. So she was like, oh, God. <laughs> oh. Wow. But, you know, I don't bear a grudge. I'm a Christian. I don't bear a grudge. And I just thought, well, I'm going to have to work with her. So, you know, it's no point making it. And we got on really well after that. I mean, she did come out with a few strange things. She says, oh, my best friend is African. She's African, but she's really nice. But, oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. And I did have to pull her up and say, w w why did you say but? No, no, I didn't mean anything. I said, no, it may not have been what you meant, but it's still what you've said. Mm. She's African, but she's nice. Wow. Wow. So it's just drawing people's attention to their behavior that they have that they're probably not aware of. Because the biggest yeah. challenge I feel is not the people who know they're racist. Like the Ku Klux Klan, I can debate with them because they're quite upfront and well, to a point. Um, they're quite upfront in what they believe, but there's many people who don't believe that they're racist. Oh no, my best friend's black. Oh, I know somebody who's black at work. Yes, it's funny. Oh, we've seen um, black people on TV. I've seen all <laughs> Idris Elba's films. I thought, okay, whatever. 
And it's those people who are the problem, the ones who don't identify themselves as racist. Yes, so especially and then when they get offended when when they're pulled up on it and, um, you know, because it's a chance to. And what I love about you is you were really positive about it because, like, you know what I mean? Like, you could have just, like, gone on the attack and said, how dare you, you racist, blah, blah, but you didn't. Like you said, you're a Christian, and we'll talk a little bit about that and your, your faith. So how did you handle that situation? I know you said you ended up, you know, becoming friends and, and, and you know, you did it really positive. So how did you handle it? Because I think this is a really good lesson for people if they are coming up, not necessarily if it's about race, but about anything where, you know, someone is showing their unconscious biases it's for me it's basically the goal is to rise above it and help them to understand because I understand that people don't understand but they don't know that they don't understand and it wasn't the first time I'd been in that type of situation because I worked for another corporate company where I was faced with eight instances of racism blatant in your face racism and I thought this is unbelievable so just give you an example of one of them the one that made me go to HR and say look I need, I need to something needs to happen is there was somebody who was late for work and I said oh where's so and so and they said oh she's coming in she's going to be a bit late she was at the lights and somebody ran into her the back of her car at the lights but she's on it I said oh is she okay they said yeah she's a bit shaken up but she's okay and they said and the worst thing is the people who run into her at the bank are black and you know how they are they never have any insurance so I thought there's some things about me you wouldn't know by looking but I'm sure you can see from looking at me that I'm black and she wasn't kind of speaking to someone and I was in the vicinity. She was talking directly to me. So it was an open plan office and you could have heard a pin drop because everyone was like, oh, how could you say that? And I said to her, I'm deeply offended by what you just said because I'm black and I have insurance. And she was, oh, that's unbelievable. So what I basically, I went to HR and they said, no problem. Just name names. We won't say it was you. And we'll make an example of these people. I said, no. I said, I want them to understand why. Because if I just tell you the names, they'll just say, oh, the black lady grasped me to HR. And she's got a chip on her shoulder and blah, blah, blah. And the problem will still continue. So she said, OK, go and speak to your boss. He's the project director. So I spoke to him and he said, look, I can get rid of them by the end of this week. You just name the names. I won't say and I'll sort that out for you. I said, no, I need them to understand why. And he said, you're a better person than me. I would have just got rid of them. I said, well, they won't understand why and it won't solve the problem. And we need for people to understand. So they then created a um, program called Respect for Others and rolled it out. So because I'd been through that, I understood that people don't understand what it's like to be a minority and sometimes they say things and they don't actually understand that they don't understand. They think, oh, yeah, I know. And then they come up with comments and you think, oh, okay. what is that? So having had that experience, when it came to this, I realized I have to help her to understand. So the, basically, I just said to her, I didn't like the fact that you just assumed I was the PA because you don't have to tell me, but think to yourself, why did you think I was the PA? And she said, uh, she couldn't answer, obviously embarrassing for her. So what I try to do in those, I, I use it as a teachable moment. I try to make it a teachable moment because I thought the more people are switched on, the less hopefully this will continue and people are ignorant about things or naive. Wow. I love that. I just really, I think that, you know, we could do with more of that in the workplace. And it's a shame, of course, that it's on you or on the person who is from the minority to have to do that. But I, I do think that's a really, it's a beautiful way of, yeah, of, of, of actually helping to create change. And I, I know that you said it's very related to your Christianity and your faith. Now, I know that you're a, a Seventh-day Adventist, but I didn't know actually until recently. And, and what I, I, I like, because I, I know that they're vegetarian and, and very vegan friendly. I don't know if you remember, you might actually, because you're a similar age to me now that we know, have established that. I, one of my favorite restaurants when we lived in London and I'd not long gone vegan was Country Life um, yeah. at Piccadilly, which is like, a, and I didn't realize at the time 
time it was Seventh Day Adventist because it was on Piccadilly. Mm. And then I remember, I remember I went past and it was closed on a Friday night and all day Saturday. I thought, why are they closed? They're at Piccadilly. They could be making a fortune. I thought, how strange. And then I was like, oh, they're Seventh Day Adventists. I'm like, okay. And like, they were just like really lovely people. I've got a feeling the chef, Ben, might work. At, I think he's at 222, yeah. okay. which is yeah. amazing for one of my favorite yeah. restaurants. Love it. So tell us a bit about, did, did you grow up as a Seventh Day Adventist or did you? You did. Okay. So you knew yeah. that already. Yeah, oh, wonderful. Yeah. Tell yeah. us a bit about how your faith impacts your life and your work. So I know you've given us one really lovely example there just of how you, you know, you dealt with that situation, that woman. How else does it influence your life and your work? It influences me in many ways. So, for example, when the lockdown started with regards to this global pandemic that we're in, they, they said the statistics that were in the media is that um, the number of people who have started to pray and think about God and so forth has quadrupled. So for me, as much as the whole, you know, coronavirus thing is frightening, because you think, particularly when it started, oh, wow, what are we going to do? We're locked down and so forth. Because I have faith in God, I know that God will protect me and help me when I need help. So, yeah, I did have fears just like everybody else, but I have a deep sense of peace because I know that this is my belief and who I can turn to in times of trouble. So that was fine because my church, obviously all churches are closed. The whole thing is online, so we do it all by Zoom and so forth. We have a church WhatsApp group. So, for example, today is somebody's birthday everybody gets a little happy birthday from them and so forth so it's still going and you're still supported as well and I find that my church being a Christian and going to church you have your immediate family but then you have what we call your church family so the church you attend on a regular basis they're kind of like an extended family as well and they reach out and will help you in times of need as well and I've had that experience and it's not just what I can get I always reach out and help those in need as well if they're in my church as well and other people too yeah no i love that and you're right yeah i think particularly yeah, during lockdown i mean i'm i'm not religious but i i i, I tap in and out of spirituality and i've certainly since lockdown like i've always been kind of curious about all different types of you know spirituality type things and certainly since lockdown i've come back to that so I think you're right people are sort of looking for for something and however that works for you and I think as long as it's you know you're being kind and you know helping people to be the best version of themselves and helping one another helping the planet and animals that's um that's wonderful and I say I do I like the seventh day Adventists because they got that um you know the vegetarian and the vegans like that restaurant was just so amazing I loved it it was just I couldn't believe it I was like oh my gosh um so I just wanted to ask you a little bit about leadership um because this is conversation conversations with you know vegan women leaders what does leadership mean to you and what style of leader do you think you are with regards to style of leader I would say firm fair and friendly particularly if I'm managing a team I'm firm because I think right this is what needs to get done and this is you know we're going to we've got a task to do a job to do and needs to get done I'm fair because some people use positions of power are in positions of leadership and they abuse that but no I try always to be fair and I always try to be friendly because I don't want to be a leader who's unapproachable and people think oh we can't look at things like that so I always try to be um, friendly and approachable and people usually say that I am so tick yay for me (laughs) (laughs) so yeah firm fair and friendly and leadership to me means being in a position where you can help guide others in a positive way and it's not dictating it's not basically just being a micromanager megalomaniac where you just like power trip and just you do that you do that you do that it's just being able to to guide and help people along the way or to get a job done yeah i love that i love that what do you love most about yourself what do I love most about myself? Yeah, I'm asking everyone this question because I feel like particularly women, and I don't like to, you know, stereotype in terms of gender, but I do feel sometimes women often have difficulties with, yeah, just either loving themselves or, you know, praising, you know, ourselves. So I'm, I'm making a point of asking this of everyone. So what do you love most about yourself? 
I, I do. Can I have more than one? Please? You can certainly can. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Bring it on. I chose one because I thought someone's bound to, you know, they're bound to at least find one. But absolutely. If you've got more, tell me more. I like it. <laughs> what I like about myself is that I'm adventurous. Um, I also like that I've been to about 46 different countries. So I've oh, traveled wow. a lot. I like my hair. <laughs> I like my hair. And what else do I like? I like the fact that... And love. Love. What do you love? You're saying like. You changed it to oh, like. Sorry, what do you like, love I most I about love. yourself? Oh, okay. I, like, oh, cool. I love my hair. <laughs> I love that I've been to lots of different countries. It's so fun to travel. <laughs> I love that. I love that I'm a vegan. I do actually like love it. I Me too. Love being vegan. Yeah. Nice. I do love the fact that I'm a vegan and people don't usually think I'm a vegan because the stereotype is the crystal powered Birkenstock wearing that kind of stereotypical and you dress in the really plain <laughs> clothing and all of that. So I like, I like, that. I love that. Yeah. So, yeah, Brilliant. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. I love those things as well. And I, and I love saying that. I, th I think I put a post up about a year ago saying I love being vegan. And I just kind of wanted to say it for no reason other than just, yeah, um, that's wonderful. So just to wrap up then, what have been a couple of key lessons that you have learned, you know, in your time on the earth, both about perhaps yourself or about life that you'd like to share with other vegan women leaders? What I would share with others in terms of my advice for women leaders is the sky's the limit. Let no one tell you you can't do it, you can't get there, and it's not possible. It is possible. I think it's Nelson Mandela said, it always seemed impossible until someone actually did it. Um, I think for a number of reasons, particularly women, where, I mean, I was watching Call the Midwife. Oh, I love that. I love, I love it. it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's yeah. quite a history lesson as well. And I thought, wow, women have so evolved where your husband had to give permission for you to have a bank account. Yeah. I thought, oh, my goodness. So we, we, we've come a long way. So it's just to say we can do anything we want to do. There's, there's no, there are barriers to success but find a way over, under, through, around those barriers, I would say. Also, the other advice I would give is surround yourself with people who want you to do well. And the, you can't always move away from all of the people who don't mean you well, but just be careful in what you say to those people who don't always mean you well. Limit your um, things that you include in your conversation to those people who are not going to have anything positive to say. And um, that's what I would say. And I would also say in terms of opportunities, I always think once you start to get lots of good opportunities, pay it forward. So if you've had somebody who's helped you, then I think it's Michelle Obama. She, I was reading an article she wrote in Essence magazine. She says, as you climb up the ladder of life, um, turn round and pull a sister up the ladder. Mm. Oh, so nice. He meant um, um, black women, but I'm, I'm just going to throw that open to women in general. Help a sister out as in uh, another female to move forward because we do struggle with um, discrimination in not, in a number of different ways, be it women of colour or just um, um, a woman in general and so forth. So yes, so help other women as well. Help everybody, but particularly women, sometimes we face barriers that are just not necessary, particularly when it comes to money as well and how much we're paid. Yes, so, yeah. very yeah. true. That's wonderful. I love that. Thank you so much. We'll put links to obviously to your website and everything to the Amazon show, which I'm oh, very much looking you. forward to seeing. I hope it will be available in Australia at some point where I get to see it as well, but we'll certainly um, put links to that. But it's been amazing talking to you. you I, I think you're wonderful and you, I love your achievements and you're yeah doing great things. So I really appreciate you sharing this conversation and your insights and everything um curly sue thank you so much thank you for having me it's been wonderful thank you so much